चैप्टर नंबर फाइव मिडिवल इंडिया पेज नंबर फोर्टी वन सेकेंड पैराग्राफ इन एलेवन सेवेंटी थ्री शाहबुद्दीन मोहम्मद इलेवन सेवेंटी थ्री टू ट्वेल्व जीरो सिक्स ऑल्सो नोन एज मिजुमुद्दीन मोहम्मद बिन साम असेंडेड असेंडेड द थ्रोन एट गजनी वाइल हिज एल्डर ब्रदर वॉज रूलिंग एट गोर Proceeding by way of Gomal Pass, Mizruddin Muzuddin Muhammad conquered Multan and Uch. In 1178, he attempted to penetrate into Gujarat by marching across the Rajputana Desert. But the Gujarat ruler completely routed him in the battle near Mount Abu, and Muzuddin Muhammad was lucky in escaping alive. He now realized the necessity of creating a suitable base in Punjab before venturing upon the conquest of India. Accordingly, he launched a campaign against the Ghaznavid possessions in Punjab. By 1190, Muzuddin Muhammad had conquered Peshawar, Lahore, and Sialkot, and was poised for a thrust toward Delhi and the Gangetic Dwab. Meanwhile. Gangetic Dwab. Meanwhile, events had not been standing still in North India. The Chauhan power had been steadily growing. The Chauhan rulers had defeated and killed a large number of Turks who had tried to invade Rajasthan, most probably from Punjab side, and had captured Delhi, called Delhi ka, from the Tomars around the middle of the century. The expansion of the Chauhan power. towards the punjab brought them into conflict with the ghaznavid rulers of the area while muzuddin mohammad called mohammad gauri in history books was overrunning the multan and uch a young lad barely 14 years old ascended the throne at ajmer he was prithviraj who was been the subject of many legends and stories the young ruler embarked upon the career of conquest overcoming the opposition of his relations he overran many small states in rajasthan he invaded the bundelkhand area and defeated the chandela rulers in the battle near mohuba mohuba it was in this battle that the famous brothers ala and udal fight died fighting to save mohuba however prithviraj did not try to annex the country The next he next invaded Gujarat but the Gujarat ruler Bhima II who had earlier defeated Muzuddin Muhammad defeated Prithviraj also This forced Prithviraj to turn his attention towards the Punjab and the Ganga valley the battle of Tarain Thus a battle between these two ambitious rulers Muzuddin Muhammad and Prithviraj was in inevitable inevitable The conflict started with rival claims for Tabar Hinda Bhatinda in the battle which was fought at Tarain in 1191 the Gauri forces were completely routed and Mizuddin Muhammad life was saved by young Khalji horsemen Prithviraj now pushed on to Bhatinda and conquered it after the siege of 12 months little attempt was made by Prithviraj to oust the Gauris from Punjab perhaps he felt that this was another recurrent turkish raids and that the gurid rulers would be content to rule over the punjab this gave muzuddin mohammad time to regroup his forces and make another bid for india the following year he rejected the proposal said to be made by prithviraj to leave him in possession of punjab the second battle of tarain in 1192 regarded as one of the turning points in indian history Muzuddin Muhammad had made careful preparations for the conquest. It is said that he marched with 120,000 men including a force of heavy cavalry fully equipped with steel coats and armor and 10,000 mounted archers. It is not correct to think that Prithviraj was negligent of the affairs of the state and awoke to the situation when it was too late. It is true that at the time Skanda the general of the last victorious campaign was engaged elsewhere as soon as prithviraj realized the nature of the gurid threat he appealed to all the rajas of the north india for help we are told many rajas sent contingents to help him but jayachandra the ruler of kannauj stayed away 
द लेजेंड दैट दिस वॉज बिकॉज पृथ्वी राजा हैड अपडेक्टेड जयचंद डॉटर संयोगिता हु वॉज इन लव विद हिम इज नॉट एक्सेप्टेड बाय मैनी हिस्टोरियंस नाउ द स्टोरी वॉज रिटर्न मच लेटर बाय अ रोमांस एज अ रोमांस बाय द पोएट चांद बरदाई एंड इंक्लूड्स मैनी इम प्रोबेबल इवेंट्स देयर हैड बीन एन ओल्ड आउटस्टैंडिंग राइवलरी बिटवीन द टू स्टेट्स Hence, it is not surprising that Jayachandra stayed away. Prithviraj has said to have fielded a force of three lakh, including a large body of cavalry and three hundred elephants. The strength of the forces on both sides may be exaggerated. The numerous strength of Indian forces was probably greater, but the Turkish army was better organized and led. The battle was mainly a battle between cavalry. the superior organization skills and speed movements of the turkish cavalry ultimately decided the issue a large number of indian soldiers lost their lives prithvi raj escaped but was captured near saraswati the turkish armies captured the fortresses of hansi saraswati and samana then they attacked and captured ajmer prithvi raj was allowed to rule over ajmer for some time but for we have coins of the spirit giving the date and the legend prithvi raj deva on one side and the words shri mohammed sam on the other soon after prithvi raj was executed on charge of conspiracy and prithvi raj son succeeded him delhi also was restored to its to its ruler but this policy was reversed soon after The Tomara, the Tomar ruler of Delhi, was ousted, and Delhi was made a base for further Turkish advance into the Ganga Valley. Following the rebellion, a Muslim army recaptured Ajmer and installed a Turkish ruler general, general there. Prithviraj's son moved to Ranthambore and founded a new powerful Chauhan kingdom there. Thus, the Delhi area and eastern Rajasthan passed under the Turkish rule. Turkish conquest of the Ganga Valley, Bihar, and Bengal. Between 1911-92 and 1206, the Turkish rule was extended over the Ganga Jamuna Dwap. Its neighboring area and Bihar and Bengal were also overrun. In order to establish themselves in the Dwap, the Turks had to first to defeat the powerful, the Gahadwala's kingdom of Kannauj. The Gahadwala ruler Jayachandra was reputed to be the most powerful prince in India at that time. he had been ruling the country peacefully for two decades perhaps he was not a very capable warrior because he had already suffered a reverse at the hands of the sena king of bengal after terain mizuddin returned to ghazni leaving the affairs of india in the hands of his trusted slave qutbuddin aibak during the next two years the turks overran parts of upper dwap without any opposition from the gadwalas In 1194, Mazuddin returned to India. He crossed the Jamuna Dwap with 50,000 cavalry and moved towards Kannauj. A hotly contested battle between Mazuddin and Jayachandra was fought at Chandavar near Kannauj. We are told that Jayachandra had almost carried the day when he was killed by an arrow, and his army was totally defeated. Mazuddin now moved on to Banaras, which was ravaged. A large number of temples there being destroyed. The Turks established their hold over a huge territory extending up to the borders of Bihar. Thus, the battles of Terain and Chandavar led laid the foundation of the Turkish rule in North India. The task of consolidating the conquest thus won proved. however to be an onerous task which occupied the turks for almost 50 years we shall study this in the subsequent chapter mazuddin lived till 1206 during this period he occupied the powerful forts of bayana and gwalior to guard the southern flank of delhi a little later aibak conti conquered kalinjar mahoba and khujaraho from the chandela rulers of the area With their base in the Dwab, the Turks launched a series of raids in the neighboring areas. Aibak defeated Bhima II, the ruler of Gujarat, and 
and Ahilwara and a number of other towns were ravaged and plundered. Though a Muslim governor was appointed to rule the place, he was soon ousted. This showed that Turks were not yet strong enough to be able to rule over such a far-flung area. The Turks, however, were more successful in the east. A Khalji officer, Bakhtiyar Khalji, whose uncle had fought in the Battle of Tarain, had been appointed in charge of some of the areas beyond Banaras. He had taken advantage of this to make frequent raids into Bihar, which was at the time the nature no man's land. During these raids, he had attacked and destroyed some of the famous Buddhist monasteries of Bihar, Nalanda and Vikramshila, which had no protector left. He had also accumulated much wealth and gathered many followers around him. During his raids, he also collected information about the routes to Bengal. Bengal, which was rich prize because its internal resources and flourishing foreign trade had given it a reputation of being fabulously rich. Making careful preparations, Bakhtiyar Khalji marched with an army towards Nadia, the capital of Sena kings of Bengal. Moving very stealthily, the Khalji chief disguised himself as a horse merchant and a party of 18 persons entered the Sena capital. He was not detected because Turkish horse merchants had been a common sight in those days. Reaching the palace, the Bakhtiyar Khalji made a sudden attack and created a great confusion. The Sena ruler, Lakshman Sena, Lakshmana Sena, had been a noted warrior. However, taken by surprise and thinking that the main Turkish army had arrived, he slipped away by the back door and took refuge at Sonaragon. Sonargaon. The Turkish army must have been near, for they soon arrived and overpowered the garrison. All the wealth of the ruler, including his wives and children, were captured. These events are placed in 1204. Due to the large number of size of the rivers, Bakhtiyar Khalji found it difficult to keep hold of Nadia. He therefore withdrew and fixed his capital at the Lakhanauti in North Bengal. Lakshmana Sena and his successors continued to rule South Bengal from Sonargaon. Although Bakhtiyar Khalji was formally appointed as the governor of Bengal by Muzuddin, he virtually ruled it as an independent ruler, but he was not to enjoy his position for long. He foolishly undertook an expedition into the Brahmaputra Valley in Assam. Though writers say that he wanted to lead an expedition into Tibet, the Mag rulers of Assam retreated and allowed the Turkish armies to come in as far as they could. At last, the tired and exhausted armies found they could advance no further and decided to retreat. They could find no provisions on the way and were constantly harassed by the Assamese armies. Tired and weakened by hunger and illness, the Turkish army had to face a battle in which there was a wide river in front and the Assamese army at the back. The Turkish armies suffered a total defeat. Bakhtiyar Khilji was able to come back with a few followers with the help of some mountain tribes, but his health and spirits were broken. And one of his own Amirs stabbed him while he was in bed mortally sick. While Abak and the Turkish and Khilji chief were trying to expand and consolidate the Turkish gains in North India, Muzuidwin and his brother were trying to expand the Gurid Empire into Central Asia. The imperialistic ambitions of the Gurids brought them into headlong conflict with the powerful Khazarvimi Empire. In 1203, Muzuidwin suffered a disastrous defeat at the hands of Khawarzimi ruler. This defeat came as a blessing in disguise to the Turks for they had to bid goodbye to their Central Asian ambitions to concentrate their energies exclusively on India. This paved way for the emergence after some time of a Turkish state based exclusively in India. In the immediate context, however, the defeat of Muzuddin emboldened many of his opponents in India to rebel. The Khokars, a warlike tribe in western Punjab, 
रोज एंड कट ऑफ द कम्युनिकेशन बिटवीन लाहौर एंड गजनी मुजरुद्दीन लेट दिस लास्ट कैंपेन इन टू इंडिया इन ट्वेल्व ओ सिक्स इन ऑर्डर टू डील विद द खोकर रिबेलियन ही रिजॉर्टेड टू द लार्ज स्किल स्लॉटर ऑफ द खोकर एंड काउड दैम डाउन ऑन इज वे बैक टू गजनी ही वॉज किल्ड बाय मुस्लिम फनाटिक बिलोंगिंग टू द राइवल सेक्ट मजरुद्दीन मोहम्मद बिन सैम हैज ऑफिन बिंग कंपेयर टू मोहम्मद गजनी As a warrior Muhammad Ghazni was more successful than Muzuddin having never suffered a defeat in India or in Central Asia he also ruled over a large empire outside India but it has to be kept in mind that Muzuddin had to contend with larger and better organized states in India than Mahmud though less successful in Central Asia his political achievements in India were greater but it was mahmud's conquest of punjab which paved with a way for mujahideen successors successes in north india considering that he the conditions facing the two were very different no useful comparison can be made between the two the political and military motives of the two in india were also different in important respects neither was really considered with islam once a ruler submitted he was allowed to rule over his territories unless for some other reasons it was necessary to annex his kingdom in part or whole hindu officers and soldiers were used by mahmud as well as by mujahideen but neither neither scrupled to use the slogans of islam for their purposes and to justify their plunder of indian cities and temples the defeat of the leading states of north india within a short space of about 15 years by the turkish armies also need some explanation it may be stated as an axiom that a country is conquered by another only when it suffers from social and political weaknesses or becomes economically and militarily backward compared to its neighbors Recent research shows that the Turks did not have any superior weapons at their disposal as compared to the Indians. The iron stirrup which had changed the mode of warfare in Europe as we have noted earlier had spread in India from the 8th century onwards. The Turkish bows could shoot arrows to a longer distance but the Indian bows were supposed to be more accurate and more deadly the arrow heads being generally poisoned in hand to hand combat the indian swords were considered to be the best in the world the indians also had the advantage of elephants perhaps the turks had horses which were swifter and more sturdy than horses imported to india thus superiority of the turks were more social and organizational the growth of feudalism that is the rise of local landed elements and chiefs had weakened the administrative structure and military organization of the indian states the rulers had to depend more on the various chiefs who rarely acted in coordination and quickly dispersed through their areas after battle on the other hand the tribal structure of the turks and the growth of the ikta and the khalisa systems which shall be discussed later enabled the turks to maintain large standing armies which could be kept in field for a long time but for those factors the rajput states many of which had greater human and physical resources at their disposal than the ghaznavid and ghurid empires would not have suffered defeat or would have been able to recover if they had been defeated in battle thank you everyone for tuning in This is the end of chapter number 5 for Medieval India. In the next part we'll start with the next chapter. Uh thank you for staying this long. All the best for exams and do share and subscribe the channel for more videos like this. Thank you everyone.